All right, welcome to another episode of Kiwi Skin Stories where neighbors meet neighbors. Today we have Jackie Gross Kellogg. She's a Kiwi Skinner since 1975. Before we do that, before we get to know Jackie, we have a quick word from our sponsor. The Academy of Martial Arts in Kiwi Skin, more commonly known as RDCA, is proud to have served this island paradise for 27 years. RDCA is a family-run business headed by Sensei Robert Dusoglu with his daughter and son, Morgan and Derek, both senseis as well. They use the martial arts, elite conditioning, and life quest, their guided self-enlightenment course, to forge a stronger you. With over 100 plus years of combined martial arts experience between the Dusoglu senseis, RDCA provides a holistic approach to self-defense, covering a unique blend of stand-up, close quarter combatives, technical groundwork, weapons training, and traditional forms. Over 3,000 students have walked through the doors and trained on the mat at RDCA in the last two and a half decades. They are proud to continue this legacy today and pass on their knowledge to the next generation of future black belts and life questers. Join them for a free introductory class to kickstart your martial arts journey. You can call them at 305-365-0129 or visit their website at rdcamma.com. For more information, you can check out the show notes. So back to Jackie. You know, like I mentioned, Jackie has been around since 1975. And she also works at the Biscayne Nature Center. That's pretty yeah. exciting. Yeah, it's fun. Jackie, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're so exciting. You were okay. highly recommended. Yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> I have to have Jackie on the oh, show. Oh, my goodness. Yay. <laughs> Sorry, my seat's a little wet because I rode my bicycle here and um, it rained. Sorry. Oh, you got yeah. caught in the rain? No, it was probably my bicycle got caught in the rain. <laughs> oh. And then since I was running late, I just sat on it anyway. Yeah, yeah that's fine. It's so, like, okay. so I just kind of like move around a little bit. So, okay. Cool. Yeah. So, so, so Jackie... Since 1975, I'm sure you've seen yeah. the key change a lot since 1975. Yeah, it doesn't even, I mean, it's so different. Um, and I have friends who lived here even longer, but <clears throat> yeah, I just remember 75, 76, because that was the big bicent bicentennial year. And it's yeah. funny because now we're approaching July 4th, and that was, you know, we used to, um, the whole thing was, um, you know, you decorate your bicycle, and so <laughs> for some reason, I don't know, my mom thought we should look like pilgrims or something. Yeah. And so yeah. my sister and I, we went all out with these long dresses. Ima in the, imagine in the heat. I mean, <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, put red, white, and blue uh, ribbons all over our bicycles, and we just ride in the bicycle in the, in the parade. So it was a lot less complicated. I don't even know how it worked, you know, <laughs> like, just show up at one time and it was in, you know, but there's some great pictures that are passed around about that year. Wait, I'll look for one. The cool, yes, please. Yeah. Because I was about to ask yeah. if you had a picture to share with us. Mm -hmm. uh, so the cool thing about the 4th of July parade is that anybody's welcome to join it and they still do that. I never remember. Yeah. Also me being in a bike with the with the i think at the time was the academy of martial arts we they invited us to do the the bike so i uh -huh. had my bike and i had bags of candy and we were throwing the candy out and and what was that a while ago or because now oh, yeah not allowed to i was throw. i was a i was a child oh okay there you go yeah and then they made it so you can't throw stuff yes. then they made it that you can't you know um blast people with cold water yes that's a yes i kind of feel guilty about that because i think it was my fault because oh, i mean yeah. actually <laughs> no it was kind of like I heard a girl, well, okay, Nelson Zambrano, don't be mad at me, but, um, so I had a Girl Scout troop, right? And we were right behind the Girl Scout, but right behind the Kira float. And, um, so that's just a prime target, right? For me growing up on the key, like, I think it's funny, but, um, some of the girls in the troop and their moms didn't think it was funny, but we got slammed with the high powered, um, freezing cold water bottles. So I, you know, my girls, because at the time they were probably like, I don't know, seven, eight years old. And, um, yeah, so they were screaming. So it was a kind of like mm -hmm. a scene out of the, um, out of like a Caddyshack movie where everyone's like, ah, and then suddenly, and then all the girls got that, get out. And stuff. 
<laughs> but where did the where did the water come from? Okay, from the Kirat float. From the okay, yeah. okay, got it. Yeah, and I don't know. Maybe the judges saw it, or somebody complained. It wasn't me. And then it seemed like the next year they um, stopped the cold water guns. I wouldn't say it was even like squirt guns. <laughs> yeah, they were like these pumps. Yeah, and it was freezing. Which is, I don't know, that's just part of growing up on the key. Like that kind of, you know, you just got, you know, yeah. shaving cream in your face. I don't know. Um, just, I think they <laughs> still roll with the, it. The shaving yeah. cream and the toilet paper is, is, is a thing. Yeah, because it's so I've... fragile now. Yeah, right. anyway. So fra- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. Yeah. When I was uh, preparing Jackie's intro, I asked her, do you want me to refer to you as Key Rat or, oh, or Kim yeah. Scanner? And she said, no, a, a Kim Scanner preferred. Yeah. Because apparently back in that day, Key Rat was, he was known as a, as a, as a oh. no fun person. Or something. Well, well, no. <laughs> okay. So, all right. You're like my psychiatrist now. Okay. So <laughs> the thing is, so I was in awe of Mr. Foster, who was this PE, the PE teacher, the PE teacher. Okay. And people who are listening who know, know. I mean, he seemed like he was like eight feet tall. He wore this like white jumpsuit and a hat. Anyway. PE teacher. And a whistle and a stopwatch. And he was the president of the Key Skin Athletic Club or the founder, everything athletics, which was me. So he was like, did not Key Rat know bad because Key Rats were like, they'd cause trouble. <laughs> you had to do mm-hmm. like you had to do certain things to become a key rat. Um, you had to do certain things to become a key rat. Yeah, no way. Honestly, there was like a like a. Uh... You know, I'm gonna take the fifth because I just can't go down this road. Anyway, okay. okay. So, um, yeah, one of them I know was caught like running through Shady Grove, which was kind of a scary place because now it's the Village Green. It's all nice and cute. Oh, with the coconut, back then the coconut it was, tree plant or something? Yeah, it was the Vivi Rebozo property that was like a, I don't know, never-ending nursery for coconut palms, something you know? Like yeah, this is my history of things. Like, I don't know, this but they good. called it uh-huh. Shady Grove and probably homeless people in there. But people built little forts and stuff like that. I don't know. But one of them, we, you had to, it would make your life so much easier if you were walking down Fernwood and you need to go to Crandon, you could just cut across, but... Back then was like no, you're going all the way around because no way was I going to cut through that anyway. Got it. So that's just how I remember it. So I'm sure there'll yeah. people listening to me who will correct me, but that's just how I remember it because I don't know. I was seven or eight years yeah. old back then. <laughs> so anyway. So what are what are other I guess uh, childhood memories you recall from your early days here in the Key? For for me, maybe a little bit different than my friends. My parents, um, <clears throat> they just loved living on an island, and they loved the ocean. So my dad was a big sailor. He had been in the Navy. Um, and my parents actually, the first three years of my life, we actually spent on Easter Island, which is Rapa Nui now. So um, then they made the big mistake of moving to New York, New Jersey, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. then, and then— they didn't like it there. Chicago, um, also, I think my dad was with American Express. And then <clears throat> then we found our way to Miami. And then my parents found out about Kiva skiing. So every weekend we were on the beach and um, we just used to snorkel um, all the time. The beach was really different than it is now. Um, and my dad used to fish, and he would go out late at night with a net and catch blue crabs, and he used to bone fish, and we would... My sister wasn't really, like, um, into that kind of stuff. Um, and so <laughs> so I would just do everything with my dad, go out to the beach and, um, you know, kind of learn, you know, like, learn by, um, I don't know, being pinched or hooked by something. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or I had a flipper in my face, knocked off my mask. Like that's that's what I remember a lot. But um, but what's cool was that I mean I don't know if it's you know ecologically it probably wasn't the best thing, but there was a seawall, right? And I I've tried to explain it to people that they didn't grow up with it. But say you went to the beach by the Commodore Club, right? Okay. And then there was this stairs, go up the stairs. And that was, I think, the island house. And then you come down the stairs, and then you'd hit this long seawall. It kind of had some barnacles on it. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe it was like um, 
two feet wide, mm -hmm. right? And you'd walk down and you just walk that thing forever and the water came right up to it. So when you sat on it, you, you could sit on it with your mask and uh, snorkel and your flippers and just go right into the deep sea. And there was so much to see, you know, there were all these little reef fish and everything. And so we would have this inflatable little Zoac, um, Zodiac and we just push it over the wall with mask and, you know, uh, snorkel and flippers and just spend the whole day out there, you know, looking at stuff that was really different. So, <laughs> I mean, it's better now, sand, I guess. But, but, <laughs> the sea wall. Yeah, because it was, at one point, um, I don't know, it was like the sand was more towards the Commodore Club down to the cabanas, you know, that was all sand, right? Okay. And then... The rest to that, to say like the beach club, that was the seawall, little sand, <laughs> abandoned, you know, those little houses that were part of the Key Biscayne um, Hotel. Okay. So you were always kind of poking in the windows. What's in there? I don't know. <laughs> so, and, then, and then at one point, the water got so high, like it was impossible to walk down to the lighthouse. So like I remember... I went away to college, I think, and they came back and they had put in the sand. And um, I remember calling up my my friend Terry White, who still we're still neighbors, um, and we were like, "Oh my gosh, we can walk down to the lighthouse!" So we did this uh, big walk down to the lighthouse. Wow, I can yeah. I, I cannot yeah in, I cannot vision a a seawall there. Yeah, and, but now we have the beach, uh -huh. which. It has been, you know, re-nourished multiple yeah, times. One but... time I remember Paul Zuccarini posted something um, that said, like, anybody who knows what this is, you know, <laughs> and it was like, I guess, one of those storms where the maybe the seawall had been covered up. So it's under there okay, somewhere. So, so yeah. right now, if it's, we, if it's we if somewhere. look where there's yeah. a seawall. Okay, so it wasn't removed. Do we... Yeah, so I don't know if it was broken up. Mm. Somebody knows, but it's he discovered a piece of it kind of by i think the ocean club beach area so i was like see i'm not making this up there was a sea wall. it is real <laughs> yeah. it is real it's around the sea wall. yeah that's awesome yeah that's awesome oh so, so you mentioned that your sister wasn't a big fan of doing those things so you spent yeah. a lot of your uh, yeah all, I, all these time with it's your so it's there. so funny because all of this is coinciding because it I recently spoke at the school board meeting, so I was thinking about my sister because my sister was just a big reader, <laughs> and yeah. so she was reading chapter books in kindergarten, which now would be like, oh my God, what would you do with a kindergarten who read chapter books? You know, you can't read. There's nothing you can read. It's all been taken away. I don't know. <laughs> so she, they used yeah. to like, I remember she had, Mrs. Carpenter was her kindergarten teacher, and they should just set her up with this little like soft area corner and she could just read her chapter books in kindergarten all day long. But, you know, not me. I was more of like um, sports, you know, um, we had amazing PE back then. That's for sure. Good PE yeah, classes great back in the PE day. Classes. Yeah. They, he set up this kind of like mini Olympics. <laughs> every every yeah. PE was like, yeah, I mean long jump standing broad jump we used to do this thing where you would um it was a high jump with the bar the metal bar and you'd run you know yes. you didn't use the the stick to lift you over i don't know <laughs> you just judged it you know and then you just it was the most exciting thing ever and then over the weekend i guess he'd put the big paddy thing the big i don't know mattress <laughs> in the courtyard of the elementary school. So we would all climb, I know it's bad, we would climb the up to the roof of the school and then we'd actually jump off the roof of the school onto the pad thing. Okay. I'm gonna blame Mike Smith anyway, and <laughs> jump onto that. We would just do that all the time. And that's just one of those funny things we all talk about now, like parents, I don't know. <laughs> Like, see when the sun comes down, whatever. <laughs> well, they say, yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of, yeah. I'm not going to use the word adults, but I've held other, I've, I've heard from from others that uh, back in the day, things were much funner. 
when there were not that many rules. I'm sure you can't do that right now. I'm sure right now it will be a impossible because of the new school is too high. Mm -hmm. But you know, jumping on the roof and jumping off will be tricky, especially with the parents. And yeah, now there's you know like a real police squad here. <laughs> so it, That's right. <laughs> they know everything. Um, and there's yeah, there's so much more you know private private lots. Private. There was always empty lots. You know, somebody would rig a rope swing, Mac Easton, and um, you would just you know do that. And now that I always think this is so funny. How you found out when and where to meet, I don't even know. You know, there was... No... Oh, like, how do you... Hey, guys, let's meet at Super yeah, Pizza no, at 4. Yeah, I don't even know. You know, it's like bees. They just know. And then we just find each other. So that was fun. My kids love when I tell stories about that. You know, like, even as you get older, you you would say, like, okay, we're going to meet somewhere. Um, you know, I'd meet up with my friends in D.C. and we'd just meet... <laughs> At one place, and people would actually show up. <laughs> you, know? you, so. can't, you can't bail. <laughs> now, I think that's the thing with cell phones. It, it makes it so much easier to bail. Like, oh, sorry, I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you know? yeah, without the cell phone, you can't be yeah. like, hey, uh, I'm going to be I'm gonna be late or I'm not going to make it. You can't do that because we're already you got, spoke. You oh, know you people are go. waiting for you, right? You're going to show up. Exactly. Yeah, I kind of keep that motto. Show up. Awesome. Invite me somewhere, I'll show up. So tell me about your work at the Biscay Nature Center. Yeah, I started um, working there. It's officially been a year. <clears throat> I was on the board for a long time, like 10 plus years. And um, so I've just been doing a little, I guess, job hopping. <laughs> so I um, so yeah, so I, I was part owner and manager of the Key Biscayne Soccer Club for like 10 years. And then during COVID, um, stopped to make a long story short, and then um, started working for the Coral Gables Community Foundation. Super okay. interesting. Learned a lot of interesting things about funds and, um, you know, just the whole, another community, right? Interesting. Um, and then um, I started working so at, to manage the summer camp at the Biscay Nature Center. And so now here I am a year later. Um, and summer camp is just the best time of the year. It's really fun. We um, fortunately are able to give many scholarships. Um, so we have a great diversity of kids, which is, I think my favorite part about Miami, the diversity of our demographics. Scholarships to attend the summer camp. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, have, um, we have scholarships throughout the eight weeks. And um, the final four weeks is a full scholarship. It's called Michael's Magic Camp. Okay. Um, um, in part, due to the Schultz family, who are also longtime Key Biscayne residents. Um, their son, um, Michael, passed away um, in the early 2000s. And um, so the family and friends started a fund with the, Coral Ga uh, with the Key Biscayne Community Foundation to, um, yeah, to start this camp scholarship called Michael's Magic Camp. And um, so the last eight weeks um, this year will be dedicated to mostly fourth graders from Charles Hadley Elementary School. Um, but right now we have a mix of scholarship camps, scholarship uh, campers, and um, paid campers, and we're having a blast. It's just, they're having so much fun. They, you know, it's a, it's a long day. <clears throat> so it's from uh, nine to five. We have a great team. We have many of our counselors are, um, studying marine biology at Rasmus or FIU. And um, so they really get in it with the kids, identifying all the creatures in the seagrass. We do uh, coastal ecology. Um, oh my gosh. So every morning snorkeling, swimming, incredible art with an artist named Jackie Rausch. And um, we do yoga. We do music with this... Um, this guy you have to have on the show sometime, Grant Livingston. Okay. He sings all these songs about South Florida nature, which is really awesome. I'm trying not to get one of the songs in my head right now. Owl will come out. You're going to start singing? Yeah. For free. Lion, <laughs> fish. Um, there's other things. <laughs> They're dangerous. Lion, fish, menace. And these are um, his songs? That these are his songs, yeah. 
And so through songs, they start to learn all this stuff. You know, what are invasive species? You know, Malaluka. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's great. he's great. You got you know what? Come the next time he's singing, you'll love it. He's is, he's fun. Is he there every day? Or about every like every or week. Every or... every week he comes. That's new this year. Every he's here every week. So, um. Anyway, camp is a blast. Um, and the nature center is a beautiful place to be. I've and been there. so yeah, it's 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 been really nice to kind of come full circle working there. Again, I remember going to field trips um, when I was a kid. The nature center wasn't there. It was, um, I think, from what I understand, it was, um, I don't remember specifically. I just remember, this is the best part. I remember they said, ride your bicycle to school today. We're going, you know, on a nature field trip. So everyone would actually bring, make sure they rode. I mean, everyone rode their bikes to school anyway, but, you know, definitely this day. So, you know, we'd ride our bikes to um, the end of Crandon Park, right? Okay. And then leave our bikes. And then, um, yeah, and then I, de I, d I definitely remember we would take, you know, a long walk down the coast and into the mangroves. And there was, um, I think they ran it through the concession stand. And then at one point they had um, a trailer and then finally built this, the beautiful building we have today. So, but I, I definitely remember those field trips. So that was, I've always been connected to nature. So, um, so it's really nice to yeah. be there. The Academy of Martial Arts in Key Biscayne, more commonly known as RDCA, is proud to have served this island paradise for 27 years. RDCA is a family-run business headed by Sensei Robert Dusoglu with his daughter and son, Morgan and Derek, both senseis as well. They use the martial arts elite conditioning, and life quest, their guided self-enlightenment course, to forge a stronger you. With over 100 plus years of combined martial arts experience between the Dusoglu senseis, RDCA provides a holistic approach to self-defense, covering a unique blend of stand-up, close-quarter combatives, technical groundwork, weapons training, and traditional forms. Over 3,000 students have walked through the doors and trained on the mat at RDCA, in the last two and a half decades. They are proud to continue this legacy today and pass on their knowledge to the next generation of future black belts and life questers. Join them for a free introductory class to kickstart your martial arts journey. You can call them at 305-365-0129 or visit their website at rdcamma.com. For more information, you can check out the show notes. So I guess for, for those that haven't been to the nature, uh -huh. Like I, I've been there, I'm familiar. I took a tour once, and it's, it's very nice. Very yeah. Nice. Also, you have the paths. What would you recommend? Maybe someone who hasn't been there who wants to go for the first time. How can they experience that whole nature center? Well, I definitely think just go to, into the gallery and take an like take an hour and actually read everything. <laughs> so just go into the gallery they have the maps you know uh -huh. so you can see the 165 acres and see all the cool trails you can explore and um then you know there's a display case of all the different kinds of um you know life mm -hmm. uh, that is there marine life bird life uh reptiles um i'm just it's interesting because everything there has been there at one time or another right so, so there, that's interesting. Then on the other corner is the story of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, right? So learn about her life, which is really interesting. Um, you know, she, she came here to Miami. That's what they called it back then. Miami. Yeah. Um, you know, her, her father was a newspaper man, you know, the whole story. But I, what I love is that, you know, she just began to, this is someone from the Northeast and she began to really to to study the layout of the land and and um became you know a naturalist and really saw what was going on and um you know especially with the everglades and and then eventually with bear cut preserve and began to teach people to see to see our environment in a new way you know through her story she was an incredible writer um so our executive director um, had the opportunity to actually get to know her pretty well. And so 
we really honor her legacy at the Biscayne Nature Center. And then we move into the aquarium, the aquarium okay? Right. And there you'll see it's kind of set up to look like a, a mangrove, you know, so you would see um, examples of all of the reef fish that we have. And then we have a touch tank as well. And the touch tank is actually kind of my favorite part because I kind of equate it to like a Roman times. Okay. Crazy things happen in that touch tank. <laughs> like, there's this um, sea cucumber, for example, who's been there like six years. How? He survives everything. He outmaneuvers everyone else, you know? The hermit crabs, the starfish, the the brittle star. Um, there's some new baby um, so horseshoe is, crabs. Is it the, the sea cucumber that has survived? Does it have a name? Um, Have you guys named it or no? We don't. Do, you know, I don't think we've it, named it. We don't try to. Maybe everyone has a different name for it in their mind. But I tell people, this is what I say. I go, if we're not careful, one day this is all we're going to be eating. <laughs> 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 and you hold up the sea cucumber. <laughs> so, oh, yummy! Yeah. So there's that. Um, but it just cracks me up because. Um, lately, I've been really fascinated by hermit crabs. I mean, I've always liked them my whole life with their little blow pincher, you know. But um, yeah, the, so I think it was like on Radio Lab. I heard this incredible story about this woman um, trying to raise hermit crabs, and no other scientist in the world has been able to breed hermit crabs. So it's really interesting because if you think about it, I mean, here's this species that completely depends on another species, um, you know, thing that they've made, the shell, right? Mm -hmm. The gastropods, right? They make the shell. Um, then they leave the shell. They either get eaten or whatever. Um, and then the hermit crab moves into the shell, right? Mm -hmm. I just find that so fascinating. Because they find another shell. So, no, the gastropod dies they don't move from shell like that's their shell that they okay. make you know it starts off like little and then okay yeah, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger I mean, think about anything from um you know the smallest little snail to a conch right big and what was the name of it um gastropod okay like it's a soft-bodied basically a marine snail right soft-bodied so, so and they, the, they, so the shell that they make uh, right they make that's, the shell, they make the shell. And so um, conch is an example, right? So here, anyone listening, conch is conch, the animal, the shell is endangered, so stop poaching it. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I know people go to Bahamas and they eat it, but here in Biscayne Bay, you know, okay. um, stop taking them. <laughs> and, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a Asia. serious problem. Yeah. Okay. Because they actually take um, 10 to 15 years to actually get kind of that size where we know them as. Okay. Um, so it's not, it takes a while, right? And if you keep poaching them, then there's going to be none left. Um, so, so you were going back to the gastropod. The gastropod makes a shell mm -hmm. and then it's it's taken once a once So the some, sometimes the shell gets, you know, rather large, but sometimes it stays small, right? And that's what the hermit crab is looking for um, because they don't get huge. You know, so, I mean, hermit crabs are amazing. I digress. But um, somehow or another in hermit crab language, and you probably should just get a marine biologist in it because I'm just, <laughs> I'm just someone who's grown up here. I mean, I did I did do like a bunch of master naturalist classes, you know, but I just kind of <laughs> talk about things that fascinate me. Um, but the, so hermit crabs have this hermit crab language, right? that they actually communicate with each other to line up like, okay, it's time to, you know, switch houses, you know, and they actually move in and out of the shells to find the one that's just right. They, so, they so, work together. So, so wait, you're, you're telling me, you're telling yeah. me that they, they gather in a line, maybe like in, in a, a line. line, it's time to switch. Yeah. Maybe your house. Yeah, I, there must be a boss man there who's making the like decisions because somebody loses out. So oh, if you think about it, <laughs> there's a loser. And so if someone is like, ah, I'm Michelle, and then ah, has to run around because they will, they'll get eaten. It's, it's terrible. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. 
So um, that soft body, the, the 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 back, it's not a tail, it's just the thorax, the whole back side. I actually have a picture I'll show you later, but it's pretty cool. It actually, it's, okay, I, I should tell you why, because um, um, to give cred to these girls um, from Carrollton who found a, a crab in a, in a Corona bottle, actually at the beach club. Okay. And they, so they brought it in to the nature center and um, they were very upset that the poor hermit crab was stuck in, I say stuck, right? In the Corona bottle. But, but we were like, hmm, but it's alive. It looks very healthy. So we just, we, we said, okay, we'll take care of it. So we put it in the touch tank, you know, we're, we're all interesting things happen and we laid it down and then sure enough, watched it come all the way out, had a couple little houses, little casitas ready for him to move into, right? Watched him come all the way out, look around, we're like, oh, get out, come on, come on, come on, come on, and then go all the way back in and then realize, wow, he likes the Corona bottle. It's like 360, 24 seven, he's looking around, he sees everything, you know, um, and then go back out, but then dragging that bottle. So overnight, cause all things happen at night, you know, he moved into another shell uh, and then another shell, another, he's the most active hermit crab I've ever seen because he was used to probably a year or two with 24 seven light. And when you're in a, a proper shell, you get some darkness, you know, <laughs> you need a little time out hermit crabs, you know, they sleep. They must. I mean, they're always like, and they put their big claw cover their they face. Their face. <laughs> yeah. Their eyes. But this one, you have to come by and see his, before you get to eaten, <laughs> his, his eyes are like really like, usually their antenna, their, their eyes are more like this. And this one, his eyes are like, like that, like, yeah. you see everything, you know? Maybe we should have yeah. him on the show or. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm trying to get him to move into, I actually bought this really cool, um, glass shell that this artist, uh, I found makes in Vermont for that purpose so that you can see the whole body of the hermit crab. And he went in there for 24 hours. And then I think he didn't like getting picked up all the time. So move shells. Oh, because once you was, I mean, with the glass shell, you were uh -huh. able to see. You can, the kids see, can see, see the whole, yeah, the, like the that, whole yeah. body, you know, cause you only see the claws and the eyes, you know, but when you see how vulnerable they really are. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Anyway, a day in the life at the Biscayne Nature Center. No, oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, the, the Nature Center is, is pretty cool, and and, and uh, it's it's a fresh, a beautiful space to be at. Definitely, yeah. I know enough people don't come just to chill. You don't have to do seagrass adventure, coastal ecology, hiking. Like you can just go and chill. And there's a uh, so one area when you when you first come in. Um, it's almost says meditative garden. It's got beautiful gumbo yep. limbo trees yep. and, and benches and you can just, you know, we were talking about mosquitoes before you have to just yeah, meditate past the mosquitoes, yeah, exactly. just the mosquitoes past are, mosquitoes, are there, right? They have got their purpose. The yeah. Just, you, you are like a supreme meditator. I think a sign. Yeah. I, I think it's a proud, whatever to just. I'm a Miami person. Mosquitoes don't bother me. Like you get when, like when you're a kid, I think you get bit, you get a reaction, but you can get bit enough and then you don't get a reaction. That's, that's where I am for a long time. I mean, I'm like, eh, you know. So what is a, as a, as a closing question. Okay. The show here. Thank you right. so much for, for jumping on the show and telling us your story. Just a fraction of, <laughs> of your story. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what is, what is a perfect weekend for you and your family here in the Cape? Um, okay, so it's it's a little weird, probably a little dark, but um, I'm my perfect weekend would be that somehow I've managed to get all of my kids, you know, um, at home, right? Maybe I made them bagels or something, and I've guilted them all to spend the morning with us, right? And my husband Joe, and um, suddenly there's a torrential rainstorm. You can't leave the island. <laughs> So they have to stay. <laughs> they have to stay. Yeah. <laughs> and we all just hang out and watch the, you know, walk. I love storms. Um, I'm on the fifth floor and I just love watching huge storms come in. 
not hurricane, but yeah. huge storms, I right? Understand. And um, and uh, yeah, ideally the lights wouldn't go out, but it's enough of a downpour. And you know how it goes. Last maybe like two hours, and then we've had a good time, <laughs> and then they can leave the island if it's not too flooded, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that would be awesome. <laughs> Rainy days in the key are nice. And yeah. I know what you mean. I, I also lived in, in, in a building and watching the storms come in. Uh, it's very nice. Right. I mean, yeah, I just love watching all that water come in. You're just like, wow, this is awesome. All this fresh water, you know? And oh, wait. And you see the clouds yeah. turning. And, and then you're like, my, my rain barrel is filling up. Yes. <laughs> it's so exciting. You have a rain barrel? I do because I'm on the rooftop. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, I have a rain barrel. And then I also have kind of buckets around to kind of. Make it go into the rain. <laughs> good, good, good. And then if I get a clean catch, you know, um, like stuff hasn't slid from the roof or something, I love to wash my hair and um, the rainwater. It's very good for curly hair. Okay. So there you, you go. Anyone out there? You, know you heard that. it here. Okay. Rainwater is good for curly hair. Yes. Makes it nice and soft. <laughs> well, Jackie, it has been great to have you on the show. Thank you. you. Oh, thank you. Story. It's fun. You're you're a good um what would you call it? A good host. interviewer, host, yeah. fun. Whatever. Yes. Dude. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. The Academy of Martial Arts in Key Biscayne, more commonly known as RDCA, is proud to have served this island paradise for twenty seven years. RDCA is a family run business headed by Sensei Robert Dusoglu with his daughter and son, Morgan and Derek, both senseis as well. They use the martial arts, elite conditioning, and life quest, their guided self-enlightenment course, to forge a stronger you. With over 100 plus years of combined martial arts experience between the Dusoglu senseis, RDCA provides a holistic approach to self-defense, covering a unique blend of stand-up, close-quarter combatives, technical groundwork, weapons training, and traditional forms. Over 3,000 students have walked through the doors and trained on the mat at RDCA in the last two and a half decades. They are proud to continue this legacy today and pass on their knowledge to the next generation of future black belts and life questers. Join them for a free introductory class to kickstart your martial arts journey. You can call them at 305-365-0129 or visit their website at rdcamma.com for more information, you can check out the show notes.